Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Phase the First The Maiden Chapter One On an evening in the latter part of May, a middle-aged man was walking homeward from Shaston to the village of Marlott, in the adjoining vale of Blakemore or Blackmore. The pair of legs that carried him were rickety and there was a bias in his gait which inclined him somewhat to the left of a straight line. He occasionally gave a smart nod, as if in confirmation of some opinion, though he was not thinking of anything in particular. An empty egg-basket was slung upon his arm, the nap of his hat was ruffled, a patch being quite worn away at its brim, where his thumb came in taking it off. Presently he was met by an elderly parson, astride on a grey mare, who, as he rode, hummed a wandering tune. "'Good night to ye,' said the man with the basket. "'Good night, Sir John,' said the parson. The pedestrian, after rather pace or two, halted and turned round. "'Now, sir, begging your pardon—' We met last market day on this road about this time, and I said, Good night, and you made reply, Good night, Sir John, as now. I did, said the parson. And once before that, near a month ago. I may have. Then what might your meaning be in calling me? "'Sir John, these different times, when I be plain Jack Derbyfield the Haggler.' The parson strode a step or two nearer. "'It was only my whim,' he said, and after a moment's hesitation, "'It was on account of a discovery I made some little time ago, whilst I was hunting up pedigrees for the new county history. I am Parson Tringham.' the antiquary of Stagfoot Lane. Don't you really know, Durbeyfield, that you are the lineal representative of the ancient and knightly family of the D'Urbervilles, who derive their descent from Sir Pagan D'Urberville, that renowned knight who came from Normandy with William the Conqueror, as appears by Battle Abbey Roll? Never heard it before, sir. "'Well, it's true. Throw up your chin a moment, so that I may catch the profile of your face better. Yes, that's the d'Urberville nose and chin, a little debased. Your ancestor was one of the twelve knights who assisted the lord of Estremavilla in Normandy, in his conquest of Glamorganshire.' Branches of your family held manors all over all this part of England. Their names appear in the pipe rolls in the time of King Stephen. In the reign of King John, one of them was rich enough to give a manor to the knights hospitallers. And in Edward the Second's time, your forefather Brian was summoned to Westminster to attend the great council there. You declined a little in Oliver Cromwell's time, but to no serious extent, and in Charles the Second's reign you were made Knights of the Royal Oak for your loyalty. Aye, there have been generations of Sir John's among you, and if knighthood were hereditary like a baronetcy, as it practically was in old times when men were knighted from father to son, you would be Sir John now. "'Ye don't say so.' "'In short,' concluded the parson, decisively smacking his leg with his switch, "'there's hardly such another family in England.' "'Dee's my eyes, and isn't there?' said Durberfield. "'And here I have been knocking about year after year from pillar to post, and if I was no more than the commonest feller in the parish.' "'And how long have this news about me been known, Parson Tringham?' The clergyman explained that, as far as he was aware, it had quite died out of knowledge, and could hardly be said to be known at all. His own investigation had begun on a day in the preceding spring, when, having been engaged in tracing the vicissitudes of the D'Urberville family, 
he had observed Darbyfield's name on his wagon, and had thereby been led to make inquiries about his father and grandfather, till he had no doubt on the subject. "'At first I resolved not to disturb you with such a useless piece of information,' said he. "'However, our impulses are too strong for our judgment sometimes. I thought you might perhaps know something of it all the while.' "'Well, I have heard once or twice, tis true, that my family had seen better days afore they came to Blackmore, but I took no notice on't, thinking it to mean that we had once kept two horses, where now we keep only one. I've got a woad silver spoon and a woad graven seal at home, too, but, Lord, what's a spoon and a seal?' and to think that I and these noble d'Urbervilles were one flesh all the time. "'Twas said that my great-grandfather had secrets, and don't care to talk of where he came from. And where do we raise our smoke now, parson, if I may make so bold? I mean, where do we d'Urbervilles live? Well, you don't live anywhere. You are extinct as a county family. That's bad." Yes, what the mendicatious family chronicles call extinct in the male line, that is, gone down, gone under. Then where do we lie? At uh, Kingsbeer Sub Green Hill. Rows and rows of you in your vaults, with your effigies under perbeck marble canopies. And where be our family mansions and estates? You haven't any. Oh, no lands, neither? None, though you once had them in abundance, as I said, for your family consisted of numerous branches. In this county there was a seat of yours at Kingsbeer, and another at Sheerton, and another at Millpond, and another at Lulstead, and another at Wellbridge. And shall we ever come into our own again? "'Ah, that I can't tell.' "'And what had I better do about it, sir?' asked Derbyfield, after a pause. "'Oh, nothing, nothing, except chasten yourself with the thought of how are the mighty fallen. It is a fact of some interest to the local historian and genealogist, nothing more.' There are several families among the cottages of this county of almost equal lustre. Good night. But you'll turn back and have a quart of beer with me on the strength on parson. There's a very pretty brew on tap at the pure drop, though to be sure not so good as at Rolliver's. No, thank you. Not this evening, Durbeyfield. You've had enough already. Concluding thus, the parson rode on his way, with doubts as to his discretion in retelling this curious bit of law. When he was gone, Durbeyfield walked a few steps in a profound reverie, and then sat down upon the grassy bank by the roadside, depositing his basket before him. In a few minutes a youth appeared in the distance, walking in the same direction as that which had been pursued by Durbeyfield. The latter, on seeing him, held up his hand, and the lad quickened his pace and came nearer. "'Boy, take up that basket. I want ee to go on a errand for me.' The lathlight stripling frowned. "'Who be you, then, John Derbyfield, to order me about and call me boy? You know my name as well as I know yours.' "'Do you? Do you? That's the secret. That's the secret.' Now obey my orders and take the message. I am going to charge ye we. Well, Fred, I don't mind telling you that the secret is that I am one of a noble race. It has just been found out by me this present afternoon p.m. And as he made the announcement, Derbyfield, declining from his sitting position, luxuriously stretched himself out upon the bank among the daisies. The lad stood before Derbyfield, and contemplated his length from crown to toe. "'Sir John Derbyville, that's who I am. 
continued the prostrate man. "'That is, if knights were baronets, which they be. "'Tis recorded in history all about me. "'Dost know of such a place, lad, as King's Beer sub-Greenhill?' "'Yes, I've been there to Greenhill Fair.' "'Well, under the church in that city there lie. "'Tisn't a city. "'The place I mean, leastwise, twasn't when I were there. "'Twas a little one-eyed blinking sort of place. "'Never you mind the place, boy. "'That's not the question before us. "'Under the church of that there parish "'lie my ancestors, hundreds of em "'in coats of mail and jewels, "'in great lead coffin, weighing tons and tons. "'There's not a man in the county of South Wessex "'that's got grander and nobler skillingtons in this family than I. "'Oh! "'Now take up that basket and go on to Marlott, "'and when you've come to the pure drop in, "'tell em to send a horse and carriage to me immediately "'to carry me home.' and on the bottom of the carriage they to be put a nug in a rum in a small bottle and chalk it up to my account and when you've done that go on to my house with the basket and tell my wife to put away that washing because she needn't finish it and wait till i come home as i've got news to tell her as the lad stood in a dubious attitude Durberfield put his hand in his pocket and produced a shilling, one of the chronically few that he possessed. "'Here's for your labour, lad.' This made a difference in the young man's estimate of the position. "'Yes, Sir John. Thank ye. Anything else I can do for ye, Sir John?' "'Tell him at home that I should like for supper, well, lamb's fry if they can get it, and if they can't, black pot.' "'And if they can't get that, well, chitterlings will do.' "'Yes, Sir John.' The boy took up the basket, and as he set out the notes of a brass band were heard from the direction of the village. "'What's that?' said Durbeyfield. "'Not an account of I.' "'Tis the woman's walking club, Sir John. Why, your daughter is one of the members.' "'To be sure. I quite forgot it in my thoughts of greater things. "'Well, vamp on to Marlott, will you, and honour that carriage, "'and maybe I'll drive round and inspect the club.' "'The lad departed, and Durbeyfield lay waiting on the grass and daisies in the evening sun. "'Not a soul passed that way for a long while, "'and the faint notes of the band were the only human sounds audible.' within the rim of blue hills. End of chapter 1